things done that we have to over here. I am Dave Lowe. I'm the CEO of ISI Federal here in, in Baltimore, just outside of Baltimore, Maryland. Um, just to give you a real quick overview, uh, before we get started, actually, uh, there's some housekeeping things. Uh, on the right-hand side, you have this, this bar, if you've never been involved in, in the webinar process. And you can expand that bar by clicking on um, the, the little arrow button up there. And in order for us to be able to do some dialogue, you, you're going to need to, to um, enter your audio pin if you haven't done that already. We can also do this by a chat. I answer questions throughout this during chat during the chat process. Oftentimes, we wind up uh, isolating somebody in the audience because um, they're either they're either friends or cl or clients of ours, and we wind up uh, including them in the discussion. So make sure that you have your audio pin uh, plugged in, and, so that we can unmute you. Right now, everybody's muted because there's feedback and all kind of other things that happen. So. About us, real quick, we're located in Baltimore, or near Baltimore, uh, near Washington, BWI, uh, by the airport. And we provide services here in, in, uh, in the D.C., Northern Virginia, Maryland area. Some of our clients you'll recognize, some of those are large guys like Northrop or, or maybe even Coastal Sunbelt. They're, they're in the hundreds of millions or billions in that instance. And some of them are smaller. Uh, we, we service a lot of different clients and a lot of different needs. Uh, into the federal space. There are three primary clients' needs that we service. If you're a do-it-yourselfer and you need some help in your market, uh, market understanding, planning, and training your folks to, to dive into the federal space, it is not your average marketplace if you're, if you're new to the federal market space. Uh, it's your not, not your average space. Uh, then the second thing that we do is we provide assistance, and that could be augmenting your, your your staff right now with folks that make phone calls and schedule meetings and things like that that have experience in, in diving into the federal space and doing the grunt work. And the other side is to kind of manage your staff. If you're not used to being uh, used to calling into the federal government and scheduling meetings and doing those things, we can set up the metrics that are necessary in order for you to be successful and kind of serve as a, as a manager. So there's two different types of assists that we do. And then there's the other piece that we do, which is handling all aspects of your federal sales, which is outsourcing your whole thing. It's a bolt-on business development force for you uh, so that you have feet on the street in Washington, D.C., as well as all the research and the components that go along with that in order to be successful. It's a we build it, you bank it, and if we're running it, we guarantee results as a re in that program. So that's just a little bit of overview there. About this webinar series, we do it every second Tuesday of the month at 11 a.m. The whole objective, objective here is to work through basic elements of, of, the, of your federal strategy and give you an understanding. But we wind up diving into specifics all the time and making sure that you can see some of the nuances that are happening out there in the, in the federal space. And we do our best to connect you with specialists and experts. I don't know. If we'll have any contracting officers today, it is the middle of September, fiscal year end. They are running around like crazy. But oftentimes we do have someone that is, is a buyer or a former buyer, and they can give us some additional insight on, on things specifically for you. Uh, this is a, to, to be a forum for business leaders uh, and to get you to federal money, which is essentially why everybody's here. And, and we're going to get to this as quickly as we can. What you should expect from this, in these sessions, this is a fire hose session. We absolutely blast you with as much information as we can. We do not follow the pack. In fact, you'll see how we don't follow the pack, and that, and that gets us into opportunities that you would not generally be able to get to if you're following what everybody else is doing. And we'll, we'll go talk on, touch on that in a minute. The other thing that you can expect from me is straight talk, and that will tell you what we see and, and, uh, and give it to you as straight as we can. And that includes help where you need it and not necessarily where you think you need it. It's very important to have a delineation there because obviously you're here because you want help in the market space, in the federal market space. And um, sometimes it's going to go counter to what a lot of people are saying. Um, and, and we will tell you the, the, the truth of the matter, um, not necessarily what you want to hear, but we'll tell you what you should hear. So help where you need it real quick, what we do, we target your market, we help position your company, 
and we help leverage relationships. They can be our relationships, they can be relationships that you have and tying them in together, whether you're going to try to do it yourself, get some help from us or somebody else, or you want to outsource the entire effort in, in, our, in our outsource uh, program. So those are the types of things. You will hear some um, shameless plugs throughout the course of this, this event, uh, because this is free, so there will be a couple of advertisements here. So as far as the agenda is concerned, we'll review the, the market-driven strategy approach that we do. Um, we'll review primary decision makers and who they are and how you can get there, working within influence clusters. If you've been here before, a lot of this is going to be similar, but we'll get to some other components, uh, including the power of relationships, some of the small business initiatives that are happening this year, coming up in 2012, which starts on October 1st, and getting yourself away from where everybody else is uh, and, and making sure that you're getting access to opportunities that most people don't see. And the fact of the matter is, is most of the opportunities are not seen by everybody. And leveraging relationships, whether they're your relationships or small business liaison relationships, we'll be talking about some of those. And what you can do in 2012, it's a great time for you to strategize and start building relationships, even in agencies that you don't have um, access to uh, right now. So we'll, we'll be talking some about that. If you do have any questions, feel free to, to raise your hand or, or throw it in a chat. Um, I try to, uh, to check these throughout the, um, th throughout the, the session. So. Let's just talk about the federal market real quick. Everybody knows that it is absolutely enormous. In fact, it's the number one customer in the entire world. Right now, they're tracking at $425 billion, probably a little bit more this year than that. Uh, 2.5 million contracts, and I want you to remember this number, 2.5 million contracts, because that's important for later in our conversation. 23% is supposed to be set aside for small businesses, and most of the time, they miss that mark. The feds buy everything. They do local, regional, national, international, and then you know embassies abroad. We have multiple wars and hot spots around the world that we that we can supply to. There's 85,000 buyers, and these are people with procurement authority that can buy things from you, and they are the number one customer in the world. So we'll be talking about this as an overall marketplace. So if that's the case, how come 92% of businesses fail? And I'm not just talking about your, your average companies, these are folks that get in, they get their GSA schedule, and they lose it after two years because they don't meet the minimum requirements. And when I say don't meet it, 50% don't get a dime. The other 30% don't reach their minimum of $25,000 per year. And I don't care what business you're in, if you're not doing $25,000 a year, that's a categorical failure. So this also includes 8A, service disabled, women owned, whatever you want, veteran owned, whatever you want. These are all included in here. In fact, the 8As, 5,000 of 9,000 8As don't get a dollar. And the, the reason being is people get involved and they say, if I get my GSA schedule, money's going to fall from the sky. Or if I get my 8A, all things are going to be good and I'm going to just start collecting money. It doesn't work that way. So. Most 8As graduate and then disappear. What that means is there's a set time for, for you to be able to perform under your uh, disadvantaged status. And if you don't do that, you're, you're going to wind up, first of all, you're going to wind up disappearing. If you do do it and all of your eggs are in that basket, by the time you reach the end of year eight, boom, everything disappears because there's no longer any value for you out in the marketplace. And what we're talking about is building the federal business in your portfolio to help you diversify and to help you maintain that marketplace because people buy from people they like. The average cost of this for, for folks that dip their toe in, and if you're thinking about dipping your toe in, listen, stop. Stop here. Book a flight to Vegas. Take 50 grand. Put it on red. Spin it. First of all, you'll save $5,000 right off. And the second thing is you will wind up having a whole lot more fun because it is very, very difficult to get into the marketplace if you're just going to dip your toe in. Lengthen your time frame. Lengthen the, what you're thinking about as far as being able to be profitable in the marketplace, and the chances are you will succeed. ISI Federal, uh, again, shameless plug, we're about moving 
the, uh, removing the obstacles to your federal sales. Uh, we just had the, uh, the Grand Prix here in Baltimore. It was a phenomenal event. It was unbelievable to watch those cars racing around the track. Um, one of the things we do is we help you target, position, and leverage. Leverage those relationships to get to, ultimately, the win. So the market-driven strategy that we approach, that we, we recommend and we utilize, is we follow the money. We want to know who's spending, what they're buying, how they're buying, their preferred vehicles, all the components that are there, what the regularity is, and the NAICS codes that they prefer, and the PSC combinations. If you're not familiar with these, NAICS codes are generally like the SIC codes, the industry codes of yesteryear. And, and the contracting officers sometimes know what they're, where to put those things, and sometimes it's, there's some ambiguity there. So uh, there's, there's ways to be able to identify how your, how your folks are buying and how they go about it. The way that we operate is that we look at, at these folks as key decision clusters. There's three folks that are involved in most of the procurements that we're talking about. Sometimes there's more. If it's a larger procurement, if you're talking about $100 million and things like that, there are, um, there are uh, any number of influencers that are involved. There's boards that are, that are, that are associated and things like that. Uh, but generally speaking, for the, for the procurement that we're talking about for, for small businesses and being able to get yourself some traction in the marketplace, you're looking at three uh, people, the project manager slash program manager. Um, either one is a term that they use, the contracting officer, or the technical representative, uh, and the technical representative. Then you have some end users. But generally speaking, the top three are the ones that, we, that we're talking about. And here's how this works. The project manager is responsible for pushing the initiatives down through the, the, the um, from the administration, down through uh, the procurement process. And they, their job is to make sure that they're in line with the initiatives. And a lot of times now we're talking about green things, you know, the whole green initiatives that are out there. These are some of the things that are hot. Uh, cloud computing, security components, a lot of these things are very hot today. Cost savings, uh, obviously, with, with the budget cuts and things that they're talking about doing. And we're going to be talking about that as well. Uh, and then there's other initiatives that are driven by political uh, components. Uh, these folks are measured by different types of metrics. And it, it's not the same throughout every different agency. Uh, but they are they're driven by performance metrics that are defined by the agency. And they're responsible for finding new ideas. Believe it or not, there are folks that are looking for people that are on the edge. Generally, it's, it's harder to get through the process if you're on the, on the cutting edge, for sure. Um, but they are influenceable. And we'll, we may talk a little bit about that, but we usually do when we start talking about influencing the scope, as well as, um, as, as, well as some of the things. One of the things about, about influencing the scope is, is, um, is making sure that you have your information very easily decipherable and also have uh, samples of scope of work. And we'll talk about that maybe in a few minutes if I can get to it. The contracting officers, just to give you a dose of, what, of who they are and what they're like, they're busy or at least think they are. And I'm telling you, most of the contracting officers that I know are very busy. Uh, they're, they're sending me messages on Saturdays and Sundays after hours. They're working. This is a very busy time of the year. And I've found that, that um, most contracting officers and folks in procurement are really uh, busy most of the time anyway. Um, they will not teach you how to work with them in most instances, and uh, they are risk averse. So unlike the project manager or program manager where they're looking for new ideas, contracting officers are not looking for new ideas. They're looking for ways to be able to safely procure this where they're not going to look bad. And their job primarily is to move paper. And this is not to diminish what they do. It is merely to be able to identify that these folks are experts in moving paper. They are not experts in what you do. I don't care what you do. If you do computer security, that's great. If you do construction services, that's great. They do a whole bunch of procurement, and it's across the board in most instances, buying pencils and pens and computers and cars and telephones and electrical services. and. Anything you can possibly imagine crosses these folks' desks. Now, sometimes they get a little bit stovepiped, but most of the time their, their job is to understand how to make that procurement. They do select the, the purchasing mechanism, and that can be a full and open RFP. It can be a blanket purchase agreement. You can run it through your GSA schedule. It could be an IDIQ. 
It can be a MATOC, it can be a GWAC, it can be any number of the various um, acronyms that are out there. And, and the whole, their, their job is to figure out what is the best mechanism to be able to get this pr procured efficiently, effectively, and to, and to find the right vendor. They're responsible developing, for developing the contract documents, and that, that includes the federal acquisition requirements, the FAR. If you're not familiar with that, chances are you should look into that because it's a very complex document, and it is what you're signing up to when you start to do business with the federal government. We're working, we're, we're working to assemble a group of experts right now that include a, a lawyer and, a, and, a, and a, a large law firm as well as a, a, a CPA firm so that we can kind of attack this with, with, uh, with that in mind in a banking firm so that we can talk about specific things. That's not established yet. As soon as it is, I'll let you folks know. Um, and they're responsible for establishing the process for procurement. They, they are very interested in the fastest way to purchase. And this is very important for, for you to know because you can leverage that very much so. And oftentimes they administer the contract post-award. So that's the contracting officer. They're the lead. Now, the technical representative, again, they're busier than think they are. Their authority is granted from the CO. However, they're, they're usually in line with the project manager um, and coming from the project manager's house. So when you're doing your research and you're touching these, these opportunities and you're seeing things that might be similar to what you would like to bid on or like to be involved in, it's important to know that oftentimes when you're, when you're looking at these folks, they may be actually under, under the arm uh, of, the, of the project manager. And it's very important to know as far as influencing the scope especially. Uh, they're also also risk averse. They are not interested in doing something that's stupid. Uh, they assist in assembling the technical requirements, which, which is very important. Uh, they look for government standards, similar purchases. In other words, they're saying, "Okay, who else has done this kind of thing in the past?" Um, and they can al they also look for certifications that, that can be driven by the scope. And here's another way that's very important for you to understand: in positioning yourself in the federal space, in that. You want to make sure that you're feeding folks the scope. Uh, they assist in mandatory requirements. And if it's mandatory that there's 10 past performances in this particular agency, they're the ones that are responsible for putting that in. Um, very important. These folks get their information from their scope from you and me. And what we want to do is we want to make sure that we're feeding them the right information. Sample scopes of work had several several requests for that this past week where we're feeding them the scopes of work so that they know what to look for in the marketplace. And if, if they're looking for somebody in particular um, and your requirements are, are, that, are good and the certifications make sense, you're the one that can be, that can be set aside um, as, as the one that, that makes the most sense. As far as the decision clusters work, it's also important to know that these folks reside in different places. Contracting officers generally in the same place. COTARs are, are usually in the project management side, but in, in these instances, they're, they can be all over the place, all over the world, in fact. But every once in a while, these folks pull together. And if we look at John and Phil and Lori, these folks pull together for a specific procurement need. They're not necessarily responsible for the same type of procurement all the time. However, they are together for these particular procurements. And there's somebody that's put in, in the lead uh, for, from the project management standpoint. And usually it's three. It could only be two, where it could be just the CO and the project manager. That's, that's not uncommon. But it's much more common to have these three, especially in, in – um, in circumstances where you're getting up to like a million dollars in the procurement in most instances, and sometimes in the tens of millions of dollars it looks like this. So um, depending on what the, the, uh, the procurement is for. These clusters then develop all over the place. They wind up creating these, uh, these groups of people that are constantly moving and they're constantly forming. And, and as they're doing this, they're doing this in every single agency throughout the government, all the time. And as a result, these folks start to bubble to the top. And these are the ones that we look for because there's trending that happen there. We like to know who are the ones that are responsible for spending the money on very specific areas in the government for our clients. 
We want to know who's doing the work for, for um, environmental services. Who's doing uh, the work for, um, for batteries? Who's doing the work for, uh, for uh, IT services for, for our various clients? So the objective, again, and, and whether it could even be as simple as who's buying pencils and pens. If you sell pencils and pens, there's folks that buy those things. And the most important thing is who buys what you sell. So, and these targets are everywhere. They're in every single agency, and they pop up all the time, and, and you can know for a fact that these people are all over the place. And, and the most important thing is to get the ones that buy what you sell. So one of the things that we do in the market, and we'll talk about this in a minute as well, is to figure out who those people are. Because if we know who those people are, we can do the six degrees of separation and Kevin Bacon game, whatever you want to call it, and we can start connecting to those people. So let's take a look at some of the things that we, we take a look at. This happens to be um, the Bureau of Public Debt. These are the agencies that we're looking into. These are the folks that we look to, to, to build relationships with. This is the target-rich environment that we're talking about. These are the decision clusters. These are one of those people in those decision clusters right here. So you're talking about Lisa Gossett, Lisa Wells. You start talking about, look at some of the dollars that are associated with this. If you look at, at you know, Lisa, obviously that's $45 million, 20 contracts written, large contracts, right? So you're looking at $2 million plus per those con for those contracts. But then you start looking at some of these other ones, like uh, 20, con uh, number nine, uh, Vernell Thompson. Uh, $3.9 million for 20 contracts. Nice size contract. I like flying again uh, underneath the radar, $750,000 and below in most instances, sometimes in the construction environment. That's challenging, but, but we like to fly underneath that because then you don't have the exposure of the Deloitte's and the SAICs and Lockheed Martins. As soon as you hit that million dollar mark, those guys are coming down on it and really you don't have a whole lot of hope there because relationships are developed and all those kinds of things. So these are the folks that we're after, and these are the far th these are the folks in the, the decision clusters. They have different roles, different objectives, uh, objectives, and different buying motives. Every one of those people have different buying motives, but every single one of those people are influenceable in those buying motives, and that's very important for you to understand that you can influence these folks. You just got to know what your message is to each one of these people and why it will resonate to them. So now we're going to talk about the power of relationships. Why, why is it so important? Everybody's talking about the government buys on price. Wrong. Wrong, wrong. The government doesn't buy on price. Is price important? Yes. However, people buy from people. They do it in the government. They do it outside the government. You and I do it every day. We go to people we like and when we buy things. We certainly don't like to go to people we don't like to buy things. So if people buy from people they like, the op what we need to know is opportunities before they hit the street. If we, ha we can build trust and credibility in order to be able to do that. And this is a long-term process, folks. It isn't just going up and doing that. We can provide them with information. We can shape, even drive the scope if we have relationships with people. So the most important thing is to know who they are, understand their world, know what you're selling before you jump in. And what I mean is if you're scheduling a meeting with a PM, know what that PM wants. If you're scheduling a meeting with a, with a contracting officer, know how they buy and why. Set the meeting first. These are some of the strategies we used. Don't sell what you sell to a contracting officer. They really don't care. What they care is how fast can you help them move that stuff. So sell them what they need, not what you have. Manage your expectations. This is going to take time. And when I say time, we're talking about 18 to 24 months. If you're doing it yourself, you better give yourself some more time than that. Here's the main problem. People go in, they say they want the quick hit, and they say, hey, let's get married. First step. Hey, here's what I do. Tell me what you have for me that you can, you can do for me. That's not the way it works. It doesn't really work that way in most places. But for some reason, there's a skewed mindset that if you go into the federal government, you can just go ahead and say, here I am, buy from me. People buy from people they like. Relationships, this is the way we operate. We do a first introduction with an email, with a one-page capabilities. 
We follow it up with phone calls, and we stalk them if we have to. This is being where they need, where they are, following up with them, making sure that we're, we're there um, all the time. This is a persistence model. Most folks appreciate persistence. They don't appreciate pests, but they appreciate persistence. So we want to we want to go right up to that line to being a pest and make sure that we're we're, we're being faithful in, in communicating with them on a regular basis. We do stop ins and meets and greets. Then over time, start looking like George instead of the other guy, and uh, you get a whole lot more results looking like George. Let's talk about some of the small businesses. Actually, let's, are there any questions, uh, real quick, before we before we jump into some of the initiatives about about the the components that are there, um, kind of the foundation? We blew through that so fast. If you have any questions, feel free to chat them uh, to me or or raise your hand. Let me check to see if anybody's raised their hand. I don't see anybody yet that has raised their hand. All right. Well, we'll keep we'll keep rolling. If you have any questions, we, we will certainly get to those um, as as we go. So, small business initiatives. Some of the things that are coming down the pipe. September twenty seventh, two thousand and ten, the White House um, did the Small Business Jobs Act. You can I'll, I'll send this out for everybody on a link. You can certainly go there and see what that is all about. Uh, I'll send the, the, this whole this whole piece out. Um, or I'll send a link to the to the uh, to this uh, presentation. In January 31st of, of this year, uh, they uh, the the White House launched the Startup America Initiative. You can read about that as well. And then August 16th, 2011, very recently, the the new jobs initiatives for rural America. All these things tie into a very specific objective that's being driven by the administration, and it's been it's been kind of moving this way. Even even before um, uh, the Obama administration uh, took over, these initiatives are moving away from large contracts with multiple layers. It is very clear that these folks that are running these IDIQs have a high level of of prime sub to prime sub to sub to prime sub to sub to sub to prime. This is an inefficiency and a very costly thing because these large companies have large overhead, and and they're 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 looking at that saying, hey, we need to move away from those. And a lot of these are are utilizing a lot of these companies utilize IDIQs, indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity contracts. So there's no real limit on these things. Um, very popular with procurement. So there's going to be some some uh, stresses there. So and there's opportunity there as well. We'll talk about those. They're moving towards smaller size contracts, but more of them. So the dollar volume is uh, is moving is moving down, but the number of contracts being written is moving up, and there's opportunity here as well. There's a move towards more fixed price contracts as opposed to just uh, utilizing P and M or or IDIQs, um, and that that limits the exposure. And we're going to see the pendulum swing. Uh, over the next several years, we're going to see it, see it swing this way, and then it's going to start swinging the other way, just like it did with the pricing structures in the in the 80s, um, and and the weaknesses of going with price alone. So we're going to see see it swing towards uh, smaller size contracts um, and fixed price contracts, which is going to bog down the system, which makes which means uh, there's some things that you could do as well. These cost cutting measures also. Uh, uh, are, are involved in this process because they're they're looking at it saying these large companies have a lot of overhead and as a result we don't really want to pay that multiple level of, of overhead um, and and we're trying to reduce the cost based on using fixed price contracts as we've mentioned they're looking for innovators with new ideas this is where there's opportunity because they can't keep going to the same folks that they know so if they if they can't keep going to the Deloitte's and they can't keep going to the Lockheed's, because they obviously are not small business, right? Lockheed happens to be the number one contractor for both defense and non-defense spending. Probably didn't know that, but that's the truth. And the fact of the matter is they know how to play the game. And and we can help with that as well. So they're going to be looking for small businesses with experience and the lower overhead. So the objective is that they're going to get the same amount of service. In fact, many of these small businesses are fulfilling the contracts. They're just not doing it 
right now because they, they can't get the bonding requirements or they can't get certain requirements in a past performance or or the, the size capabilities that are that are required. If it's a nationwide contract, somebody's got a service nationwide, that's a that's a large company operation. So they're, what they're looking to do is they're breaking these things apart and looking with, with uh, for small businesses with lower overhead. So what can we expect in uh, 2012? We can expect that the, the, the total dollar spend will go down in dollars because of restrictions and continuing resolutions. I'm, I'm sure that if, you, if you've been reading the news, you, you've heard about those. And uh, we can expect CRs to continue through 2012, maybe the entirety of 2012 for various reasons. Uh, budget. Budget cuts are, are certainly on the on the horizon. They're 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 a hot topic in the po political uh, market, which also has ramifications with election year positioning. And these are things that that if you're scared to death, uh, don't be, because I think this actually works in your favor for getting into the space right now. Um, so we're looking at more smaller revenue projects. This is great for small business, and it's great for making sure that that you get your word out there uh, and, and you can do it. It is bad for procurement because their workload just increased exponentially. And this is good for you as well. So what does this mean for you? The smaller projects mean more manageable proposals and much better chance of winning. And we're all about the win, all about it. And we're going to talk about some of the things that you're not going to believe some of the things if you haven't been on here before. If procurement is overloaded, they go to who makes their life easier. If, if there's anything that you should print out is make their life easier, put it on a banner. If that is your objective, figure out what makes their life easier and do it. In procurement, it's simply giving them the ability to be able to buy from you without jumping through a bazillion hoops. If you have some sort of, be, of mechanism to be able to purchase, if, if you don't have a GSA kit, one, if you if you do have a GSA, market it, and if you and get yourself established with some blanket purchase agreements, BPAs, so that they can purchase from you directly. Do the competition ahead of time. Make sure you're helping them get the get the uh, get the folks weeded out, especially the competitors that you don't that you don't want to have. All you have to do is help them make their life easier. Make a big banner, hang it up, make their life easier. So here's one thing that we're recommending. You, de you develop your strategy around the market intelligence. Now, that's pseudo self-serving because we do provide the intelligence. And then we, you define your approach by using competitive intelligence. What we mean by that is if you know who you're after and you know who usually is buying from your competitors, then your approach will be when you see a proposal, an RFP come out that you have to respond to, request for proposal, you wind up knowing who's probably the primary incumbent. And as a result, you can tailor your message to, to combat that incumbent, or you may decide that you don't want to compete at all because you don't think you can win. And a lot of times you can't. That's just a fact. A lot of times you don't have a chance because they have a relationship, and you can't, you can't beat that. So. But, but if we develop your strategy around the market intelligence, define your approach using the competitive intelligence, do what they do, don't reinvent the wheel, go steal their wheel. Go use what they do and do it. So this is how you can get there. Winnable opportunities. Again, people buy from people they like. It doesn't change in the marketplace. And when you have a relationship and you find a need, that's when you have a winnable opportunity. It's not out there for everybody to see. You're not a proposal generation service. You have a product and service that you provide, that you sell to, the, to, the, to, ever, to whoever you're in business with now. If it's the private sector, you're, you're selling to the private sector. Relationship plus need equals a winnable opportunity. Happens the same way in the federal space. If you're already doing federal work, that's not a problem. This, it, same thing happens here. You know it if you're doing federal work. If you have a relationship you have a need, this is where you get into minimum competi competition. Did you know that 50 to 90 percent of, 95 percent, sometimes 98 percent, we just found, of opportunities have less than five competitors? Now, this is contrary to everything that you would possibly see. Uh, one of our clients is Show Call. They're an event planning uh, services. They, I mean, they do 
great work. They've done the um, the the G20 summit. They did the papal visit. They they've done enormous. They did the inauguration. They I mean they do big things. They also do little things. Some of these things are all they can be small. But take a look at this here. Look at the number of competitors here in the event services industry. These first five, $1.5 billion, 97%, fall within the first five. So less than five competitors. Can you deal with that? I can. I'll, I'll work all day with five competitors. I just don't want 20 or 30. So how can you get there? It's about positioning and understanding your federal buyer every single time. If you know what they need and you're positioned, that's where you win. You can get access to these things. Last week we had, we had somebody ask us if we did a particular service. It's one of my clients. And it was in the security industry. And it was a very, we, I shot out a, a follow-up email, just a, qu a quick reintroduction for our for our our, uh, our client is Janice Associates by the way. And um and, and she kicked back, do you do this type of testing? And I said, Yes we do. She said, Can you supply me with a, a sample scope? I said, yes I can. And from there we started to, to, to be able to hone in on, on what she really needed and how and how our my client and our and, and we can work together with that. So Find the people that need to like you and help them like you by giving you giving them what they need, not what you sell, what they need. So what do contractors, contracting officers need? First, they need political cover. They need technical cover and they need pricing cover. So these are the three pieces. We, we call it covering them up. If we, if we have political cover, that means whose who's ox is going to get gored if you win? And if somebody has uh, a leaning towards a particular uh, incumbent, or a particular other company that's looking to get into the federal space, making sure that your political cover is in place, that it's a safe bet for them to choose you. The technical cover, that's your qualifications right there. And pricing cover. So the, the political cover comes from your approach, how you get into the market, and how, you, and how you're working with this, with this particular uh, buyer. The technical cover is your capabilities. Your pricing cover can be your GSA or whatever contracting vehicle you have. The most important thing is to make it easy, give it to them in a nice package so that they, one, they can be very comfortable, pass performance, give them everything they need, and give it to them to make it easy for them to choose you. Um, and you need to have these pieces in place in your federal strategy to be effective. It's not easy doing what everybody else is doing. It's not easy. Here's what happens. People look at it and say, look, I can get all this free information. I have Ozdaboos. Anybody know what that means? Office of Small Disadvantaged Business Utilization. They have no decision-making authority and no influence in scope process. Are they valuable? Yes, they're valuable. But they're not valuable from the standpoint of going to meet with them as far as, as getting a sale. It doesn't happen. The other thing is Fed biz ops. How many of you are monitoring Fed biz ops? Remember before when we talked about it, there's 2.5 million, 2.5 million contracts executed in a given year. About 70,000 of those hit Fed biz ops. And it's supposed to be everything above, above $25,000, not necessarily so. There's other procurement mechanisms. There's other ways to be able to publicize your, the opportunities, which, which minimizes the competitors. And it doesn't necessarily go out to Fed biz ops. The other is NAICS notifications. If, you get, if you're in the business, you know what I'm talking about. You put your NAICS codes in, you get a bazillion emails sometimes every day, especially right now if you're monitoring, because I know I see them. So your NAICS notifications saying, hey, here's what's out on the street for the FAA, or here's what's out on the street for, for uh, Army Corps of Engineers, or here's what's out on the street, everything. Right? So you're watching, you're getting these. Some of those are fed from Fed, fed Biz Ops, so they're coming and pop, pop, pop. Um, Remember, everybody else is getting this too. It's all public. Full and open RFPs mean lots of competitors, lots of bid responses, political exposure sometimes. The, the larger it is, the, the more exposure there is. It's months of work. It's a long sales cycle, 8.3 months on average from the time of conception to the time of procurement and award. 
So the, and that includes some of the shortened ones too, by the way, that are all full and open. So these are the types of things that you're up against when you're out on Fed Biz Ops, and this is the way that we look at it. Everybody's trying to turn in the same direction at the same time. Is this easy for the contracting officers and procurement people in the federal government? Is this easy for them? Is this profitable for you? If you have 30 competitors, I'm telling you, there's not, unless you're really whizmo at being able to do something cutting edge, the chances are you're going to take a bath or maybe you bought it or maybe you're just not going to be profitable on it. I can't stand this model for profitability reasons. It's an enormous federal market, as we said before, 245, 245 getting dyslexic on myself, 2.5 million contracts. If Fed Biz, you go to Fed Biz Ops right now, you will see, if you search the past 365 days, there's a rolling 365-day calendar if you go to Fed Biz Ops, look at all of them going to come up with between 65 and 70,000 awards. Where are the rest of those? Where are the rest of the 2.5 million awards that are given every, that, that are awarded every year? Where's the two four four hundred twenty five billion dollars? Where is that? It's all over. It's peppered all over the federal space and this is how you can find out what it is. It can help you know your market plan, dedicate your resources as we talked about before. Here's the help where you need it. This is a commercial time. Capabilities review, we'll talk about some other things in a minute, but capabilities review, you need a one-page capabilities statement. Very simple, not complicated. We can do that for you. It's a great way to engage us early on, $199, easy. The intelligence component, regularly $3,000 is $2,500. Your plan. This gives you your plan for your market, the right people at the right agencies, your competitors' contacts. There is no better intelligence resource. I've looked at them out there. there we, we are heads and tails above the rest. We're building a database. It's going to take a couple years, but we're building a database now that, that we're utilizing for our clients because of the information that's here is so valuable and the connections that, that are established are so valuable. This is, these are within your marketplace what you sell. Not everybody else in the market. It's 85,000. It's not going to be 85,000. It's going to be a couple hundred, and these are the ones that are responsible for buying what you sell. Then there's an initial blitz that we do, which is an introductory process, and, and the introductory process is going to be for, for October. Uh, that's a 49.47 value. Uh, we can do that today for 39.50, and we'll talk about that a little bit more if you want to. Just so you know what it looks like, there's a key contacts within each agency that you can leverage those relationships. And what we mean by leveraging those relationships, if you're going to talk with the small business advocates, Oz the Boos, the liaisons that are responsible, and there is one for every agency and every sub-agency. There's bunches of these folks out there. Remember, they don't have purchasing authority. However, if you have your connections ready before you meet with them, you can tell them who you want to meet with and who's important. If you have your capabilities, you give it to them, and they'll disseminate it to the people that you need it disseminated to, if you haven't done it already, and ask them to schedule meetings for you with these specific people. Not complicated, but once you start doing that and you go in and you say, hey, here's who I need, they're going to look at it and say, dog, gone. You know what you're doing in this marketplace. I, we, I was just, most, most clients that we just start out with, I'm in a meeting. And I go down and I meet with the small business advocates. It's a great way to get my teeth kicked in. It's a great way for me to understand how, how we are supposed to be servicing our client, the kind of questions that they're going to ask, and the types of things that I have to answer. It's not just about the elevator speed. Somebody's going to ask me some serious questions about what we do. And when, we, when we're representing one of our clients, we are them. Carry their business cards and my name on their business card. I am the director of federal of federal. Uh, solutions for most of our clients. And when I walk in, I want to make sure, hey, I want to meet these people. And they can schedule those meetings for us. Also looking at the current contacts. Who do you know right now? And who do you know that knows somebody that you need to know? If you have the end game, classic, seven habits of highly effective people, begin with the end in mind. I want to meet Jim John right there. I want to meet this guy. 
And then how do you go about building the bridges to that, to that person? So again, these are the agencies. We look for the agencies, but not the agencies first. We look for the people first. Let the market drive you. Let the market drive you into those agencies so that you know for a fact that these are the people that are buying. Every single person in your market intelligence has incredible value. Why? Because they're either the decision makers or they know the decision makers, and they're in that decision cluster, every single one. And so what we want to do, what we want to do is help you establish the relationships with those folks, and there couldn't be a better time. Well, there was a better time. It was probably May to do this because then we could have been in, in the fiscal year-end blitz. Very important to take a look at this. Take a look at these spikes that are happening. Every one of those is in September, right now. Right now we're in the middle of a feeding frenzy that's enormous. So it's too late. It's too late to get there now. The, the planning for that happens in April and May. The foundations for that happen in October, November, December, so that you can get yourself positioned for April and May. Are there contracts that are happening regularly throughout the government? Of course there are. There's hundreds of them happening right now with what you sell. However, there's a spike in September. So everything that you do should be looking towards September of 2012 now to establish yourself within these, these, these agencies with the people that are buying so that you can position your company to get those. October, December is the best, the best for business development. Not for sales. Business development, sales, two separate things but doing the pieces that lead to the sales, doing the pieces that, that lead to the lower hanging fruit in the future. And you have to be faithful with it. You can't just go in and say, here, here, here I am, and just wait. No, sir. There's a ping cycle. We call it a ping cycle. Sometimes it's three weeks, sometimes it's four weeks, sometimes it's six weeks, sometimes it's two months. But when those people are asking for it, ping them. Send them information. Send them an updated capability statement. Send them some news on some of the things that you just procured. Send them a sample scope of work. Say, hey, just in case you need this sometime. When we do these things, when we send out the, the, um, the capability statement, we have contracting officers pulling it out, sticking it on the wall. Why do they do that? Because they're saying, oh, I don't, I don't normally buy environmental services, but I do remember I did it a couple times last year, so boop, I'm going to put this right here. So next time, it's hanging on their wall. I go into places, it's hanging on their wall. Unbelievable. The best time to strategize and start planning for September 2012 right now. October, December, do the introductions in October, get some meetings, get in there, get yourself known. And, and the best way to do that is, is, is what we're talking about today, is, is assembling this, getting, doing the capabilities, making sure your message is right for the right people, planning for your marketplace, get, get the intelligence, understand what's happening in the marketplace. And, we, and, and that's what we do every day. We find the right people. We also make sure that your house is in order. If you need a GSA, we can do that. We can work on your capabilities. We update your CCR, your ORCA if you're in the construction world. Um, and we help you identify certifications that make sense as well. Get in front of the right people with the right message. Make it easy for them to like you and make it easy for them to buy now. They can't buy from you if you don't have a contracting vehicle, folks. It's very difficult. Could they? Yes. If it's less than $2,500, they can put it on a credit card. Absolutely. We have, we have clients that operate that way, where they're just in, the, in it for the small things. They just have thousands of small things. A thousand, two thousand dollar orders, that's, that's money. Getting into the millions of dollars again. And it's all flying under the radar. So. Remove the obstacles to your federal sales. Target positioning, leveraging is what we do, and it's all about the win. Um, some additional resources you can, can be found at isifederal.com. You can see our Limerick process there and the links. You can download a free government uh, handbook. You can fill out a free survey to figure out if you're ready. Um, and there's also RSS feeds from the government site. And if you want to join me with LinkedIn, please send me an invite. Um, my contact information, is, I'll give you that in a minute. But OK, let's open this up to questions for everybody that, uh, that's here. Um, and let's see if we have anyone. Hold on one sec, guys. Sorry about that. All right, everybody's muted. 
All right, well, let's see, questions that we have. Uh, what type of, who are the people that we're talking about in the intelligence? Okay. John, uh, the, the folks that we're talking about here in, in the intelligence are, I'm going to skip around real quick and I'll show you some of the things here. This is a sample of the report and, and, and what we do. Let me jump over here. Move this here so I can maneuver. I'm going to scroll down into this. Um, what we do is we look at whatever makes up your marketplace. And your marketplace, it, your NAICS codes, your PSEs, how your competitors are buying is what mostly we, we look at first to say, okay, if we know somebody that's out there in the marketplace is doing it, then we can identify the key people that are involved. So if we look here, um, these, these are the folks. Now, Eric Manning works with the State Department. All this is scrambled, by the way, because th this came from real data, but we switched everything around. But if we take a look at this, 18 contracts for $222,000, smaller in, in size and scope, uh, 28 for uh, $2.7 million uh, with the State Department. The, these are the folks that are actually executing the contracts. Now, they're, most of these are contracting officers. Some of those are COTARs, and some of them are project managers, believe it or not. Um, every one of these are one of those legs in the decision cluster. So what we're looking for are the ones that, that rise up to the top, specifically within the parameters of what you sell. Some, some folks get very broad um, or have broad industries like engineering. If you type in engineering, you could be engineering a, a parking lot, or you could be engineering a space shuttle. I mean, it could be anything, right? So, so we try to hone that down and remove some of the noise um, with that, uh, and then and then we present what what the market looks like. For instance, uh, real quick, I'll show you. Let me zoom in here a little bit. Uh, we normally look for a year or two years in trend. These are the primary NAICS codes, and then we identify the competitors. Here's the market segment: one one point six billion dollars with. 44,000 contracts. So the average size is 36 and a half, right? So this is important information because the people that we're talking about are the ones that are buying those dollars. They're responsible for purchasing those. Um, we can't find all of them, but we can find a lot of them. In fact, we find four times as many as anybody else that we've ever been able to, to, to locate out there. And, and connecting the dots within the agencies and, and developing the, uh, the hierarchy uh, is very important. So we identify the decision makers specifically. So if we can l go down a little bit and we'll take a look at uh, the contracting agencies, then we look at the NAICS codes. Now remember we had primary NAICS codes, right? These are the primary NAICS codes, but we're not just talking about those. There's 21,000 in your primary NAICS, but there's still 6,000 here and there's 3,500 here and there's 3,300 there and 2,500 and, and you go down and, and then you start seeing them dwindle. And the reason being is because the contracting officer may not know where to put this particular piece. He doesn't do enough of that procurement. Or he does know, and he knows exactly who he wants to win, and he puts it over there so nobody else is looking. Multiple reasons for that. It happens all the time. Sometimes it's based on small business size. Did you know that some small businesses are up to 1,500 employees? Well, you could be small business. doesn't matter who you are, pretty much. If up to 1,500 employees, so we look into the NAICS codes and we looked in, look into the PSCs. Most of that is driven by what we find out from the competitors and also your information if you're already doing business with the government or if you're not and we just look, look to see how you line up. Make sense? So what, a, what other services do you provide to make sure that we can get in? to the government. Okay. I like softballs. Um, thanks, Sarah. Um, the, the types of services that we look at providing are, defined, uh, are based on what you need. If you need us to do all the work, we'll do all the work. Um, and that includes knocking on doors, meeting and greeting, going on, going on meetings, and that can be anywhere, um, anywhere in the world. Anything that you would hire somebody to do, and, and, and support of your organization, we do. Um, and it can, be, it can be incremental parts, 
if we have a cafeteria way of being able to do it where you need some phone calls being made, meetings scheduled, you need follow-ups, you need somebody to monitor the emails, we do that for our clients. We set up email addresses that specifically uh, we, can, we can actually respond for, usually it's the VP or the president of the company where we're, we're in doing introductions and then we're, we're fielding the, the information and, and responding so that we can start to distill the things that are, that are important and the opportunities that come up. Uh, the final meetings depends on whether you want us to run with it or you want to have somebody on your staff to do the actual meeting, and and we have clients that do both. We also have clients that we we do the intern we do the research and we give it to them and they say hey, um, that's all we need and that's that's what we do. We can certainly help in all those those aspects. Um, I'm definitely available to to pump. Let me see if we have any other questions here. Uh, here's a question from Eddie. Hang on, Eddie. Are all of these potential opportunities that it, that you have discussed today for GCs, or can they be for subcontractors with specialty? Yes, the answer they can be both. Um, some of those are for GCs that, and some of those are for specialties. We have very specialized clients. Some of them, um, Nautic Air does. Um, air purification systems. Obviously that goes in line with uh, HVAC systems sometimes. Um, some, of the, some of the folks that we have batteries, specialty batteries that go into forklifts or backup UPS systems. Um, so, so those are very specialized. Um, in your instance, it sounds like you guys are doing some sort of construction component. Um, and if you, where are you, Eddie? Hang on a second. I'm going to unmute you. You there? You there? Yes. Hey Eddie. Hello. What, Hello. What, type of, what, kind, what type of construction do you do? We are a walls and ceiling subcontractor. Walls and ceiling. Yes. Okay. So most of the things that you have are usually sub to a general, right? That's correct. Right. Well, some of those you'll find to be the case. The same thing happens in the federal space. You'll find that most of those will be um, most of the way that same way that happens in the private sector. They'll be, they'll be sub to a GC. However, the interesting thing is that sometimes you have some projects where there's um, maybe some, um, some damage to water or whatever it happens to be, right? So you have right. some, some what, is, what do you call that? It's a reword. Recon, not reconstruction. What is it? Um, rehab or? Re, rehab, yeah. Yes. So you're doing, you can do rehab or, or um, in, you know, what would normally be considered insurance work, right? Yes. Um, so you have a lot of opportunities in that arena, and usually those are smaller in, in scope and faster in turnaround, too. So um, there's, the, the benefits there are, one, if you have the contact that's doing that, then you're gold, right? Because at least you're, at least you're in the right place. And, and you keep marketing to them, and eventually they may wear down and actually use you, or you might just be there when when one of their prime people can't fulfill the contract. So that's one component. The other is is that these folks are working with general contractors on a regular basis. If you go to a Whiting Turner right now and you knock on the door and you say, "Hey, I want to do some ceilings and walls," and yeah, you and 500 other people that were here yesterday. But if you have if you have the internal guy in the federal space that's stroking the checks and managing the project, referring you to the project manager with Whiting Turner, you have a much better chance of being able to develop a dialogue and saying, hey, because he doesn't know. You're, you're, the guy at Whiting Turner doesn't know the type of relationship that you have with, this, with the PM or with the contracting officer, does he? No. You're not going to share it necessarily. You're not going to give that information up. But if you have the ability to be able to then tap into that project manager, chances are at least you'll get a look. You might not get the project next, but again, it's a business development, relationship development thing, no different than it, than it was when you started. But the, um, again, that's, that happens by osmosis and, and on purpose, by the way. You, want, you, you know that most of your stuff is happening from, from GC. So knowing that is the case, that's, that's really what we want to make sure that we get into. But yes. Uh, there, it's across. It's both. Does that did that answer the question, sort of? Yes. Anything else you, you're thinking of before I jump to a, to another another question? 
Well, I was thinking of what kind of contacts you have at, at one of the Army bases that's right here local to me. Where Where's local? Fort Leonard Wood, Kansas City, Missouri. Fort Leavenworth. Okay. Fort Riley. All right. I know, I know, I know folks in, in every one of those installations. Now, whether they're responsible for what you do, I don't, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but what happens normally, and some of those, some of those will fall. They could be Army Corps folks, right? Or they right. could be, or they could be actual facilities installation people. They could be GSA people that are that are managing buildings. Um, not normally on on bases like that, though. Usually they're going to be managed by just on-site facilities. Um, and I do know some of those folks, uh, and some of the folks that are doing. There's some pretty large remediation projects that are happening in Kansas. Um, that don't affect you necessarily, but I know about them because of an environmental contact. So, but the most important thing is is who it is there that buys what you sell. What's your geographic footprint? Um, pr primarily Kansas, Missouri, uh, the whole, the whole, those two states. I've also okay. done some work in Oklahoma, but didn't. It was one of those competitive scenarios. Right. It didn't work out very well. Yeah, it's it's hard it's hard to make money when it's when everybody's out there, mm -hmm. as you know. Um, so, uh, but yeah, we we certainly we know a lot of the folks with with the Army Corps, um, and and if we don't know them, we know people that know them. You know, it's that whole okay, we'll get one step closer, uh, and the process that we use usually works very very well for being able to get introduced there. Um, so we can we can talk about that a little bit more offline if you if you'd like to. Yes, uh, I would like to do that. All right. Let, uh, if you can, do me a favor and shoot me an email. Let me give you. Let me make sure I put this up here. Um, my email is is dlo at isifederal dot com. I mean, I know that that um, we've shot some things. Um, okay. Okay. Hey, Dorothy. I got another one from from Dorothy. We'll we'll talk in a little bit, Eddie. Okay. Yes. Thank you. All right. You got it. Hey, Dorothy. Hey, Dorothy. You there? Yes, I'm here. Hey. Um. Wow. What a great softball question. I appreciate that. I I ask that question because they're going to think you're a plant. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> Just curious. <laughs> hey, Dorothy, yes, you said 92% of businesses who try to enter the federal market fail. What is your success rate if you handle the entire effort? Um, if we handle the entire effort, we we succeed. We don't stop until we do. So, um, what what we do is we it, it when we guarantee it, it's a it's a shared effort. It's not that's not cheap. It's like hiring somebody on staff, so you know. So you probably okay. need oxygen after that, but the um, but when we when we're involved, the, the objection is the objective is to get you traction in the space. And in order to get to a million dollars, you got to go through ten thousand. You got to go through two hundred thousand. You got to go through five hundred thousand. And then after you get to a million, and you want to expand to to five million, ten million, um, that's how it's, that's how the growth works. Um, and it 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 all depends. I can tell you that it it depends on your ability to. To, to deal with 18 months to 24 months, and and the expenses that are that are involved there. Uh, but gen yeah, we won't we won't let you fail. And if, okay. we, if if we if we if we wind up not doing it, which we never miss, by the way, um, then we'll refund half the money that you pay us because it's a shared. We share the risk, and uh, one of us or both of us were wrong. If, if we both decided, but if we do the intelligence and we find out what you're, what do you do as in for for say, what do you do as a company? Uh, we actually are in the area of publishing, and by publishing, I mean we actually write and develop um, materials depending upon what the um, client wants. Um, specifically, we've done it for um, in the area of um, education. Education training programs. 
Yeah, training, but it's really more for um, like kindergarten through high school kind of things, although we have done some, you know, adult, adult education um, materials. Very specific. It's very specific, and you know there there are we don't we don't actually print materials. Let me make that clear. What we are is that we develop the content. We actually develop the content, and generally speaking, um, the client tells us you know what the subject area is, um, what's the market, what the target audience is, and so we write to whatever specs um, the client provides to us. We've been in the educational publishing business for um, like thirty years, so um, well, with business has been around for about. 17 years, but we've all been in, our, our employees have been in the business for like over 30 years. And any other pieces that you have, like small biz, small probably, right? Yeah, we're a small company. Okay, small biz, um, minority status or anything? Women owned? Um, uh, women's business, women's business. We haven't applied, we, we were eligible, but we have not um, completed that certification yet. Okay, so you have women-owned small business, and you could probably, depending on, on the size and, and who owns it, you could get this advantage as well. Um, training business is hard to get into. We've, we've been in the space for the last six years. That sounds like a challenge, John. Sorry, I was just reading. He's responding, and, and uh, there's, there, there's components for that. But there absolutely is, is room for publications. I, and when you separate your core competencies from from the education and the K through 12 because I'd have to look to see where K through 12 would land because unless you're talking about uh, the, the, unless you're talking about some um, some type of PR initiatives that the Department of Education is running through, I'm sure there's things that are there that they're, mm -hmm. that they're developing content for uh, I haven't looked into that I'd have to look into it before I would sign up to say hey we can do the full boat um, okay and whether it would be worth it for you or whether it even makes sense for you. Um, there's okay. pieces that we can do. Because we do everything for business development, we, we can narrow that down to a specific pieces that you need and make it affordable for you as well as effective. That the objective is to get you the work. So, um, But, yeah, if you're, if you're in the content development and the client tells you the subject and you and, and the target audience, that methodology can be overlaid in just about any market, and there's a lot of that. I know there's a lot of that because there's there's a couple of folks that I know that have been in that industry, and and okay. some of those are very specified specific. So, um, okay, great. Ed, hang on a second, John. Hang on a second, John. I gotta pull you up, man. You're you're blowing me up. You there, John? John. Hey, hello. Hey, John. I got you and Dorothy on the phone. This is what I love about this. You never know who's going to show up, and you never know who's going to participate. Um, uh, he just to bring her up. I'm reading your your your. Uh, oh yeah, I just wanted to to respond if that question if that was uh, that chat was able to be live to everybody. But uh, uh, we our company's been in the training development space, and the reason why we decided to hop on this conference is because. Uh, in the last six years, we've been in the trade and development space, and we've come from corporate America. So the government was a brand new training arena and a brand new market to attack. And uh, w some of the stuff that we've already done is uh, some of the stuff that you've already listed, like a GSA schedule, following up on those. And when originally we thought we had a GSA schedule, well, it's open hunting license to everything. but. Um, as you kind of described, it's really about getting to the clients, figuring out who the PMs are, figuring out where the money's being spent, and that's a huge part. And that that part actually took us the last three, four years in order to compile that information in our own company. So uh, some of your uh, help in getting that information is really useful, actually. Um, but just to get uh, to allude back into the training space, there are so many players in the training arena uh, with the Army because there's uh, so many people that need to qualify the training. It's the people that either create the products uh, to be either trained on. It's the schoolhouses. It's the uh, TRADOC happens to be the uh, the training capabilities manager for the Army. So then there's like NETC for the Navy. Um, the Air Force has their own version. And all those people need to have buy into training. So training happens to be pretty tough to get into if you do not have 
the subject matter experts and the expertise in that particular field to get in. It, there, there is quite a bunch of lead time or uh, a lot of research that you have to do in order to really pick the correct niche market. And you, We've and done. I think, John, you just hit it right on the head, and that is there are places where you cannot compete effectively. And a lot of times that's where you would go when you were thinking to go compete. Because, you know, you think about data security, for instance. Right? Data security, is, who would you go to for protecting privacy, private information? The Social Security Administration, IRS. Everybody and their mother has been to IRS and Social Security Administration. That's where it is. Same thing what you just said with training with, within the military. Everybody get, runs to the military. But let me tell you something. There are thousands and thousands of contracts that are issued every year that are outside of the military world for training and specifications and requirements for things that you that, that the subject matter experts certainly very important agree um, however it's not nearly as 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 critically placed as it is in the military and what you'll find is that if you go outside of some of those that are your traditional places where you would anticipate them to be, there are sub agencies and maybe it's only fifty thousand dollars or a hundred grand or you know maybe or maybe it's a combined effort where they're gonna do now there's a lot of webinars and, and things like that to be that they're doing uh, for off site meetings as opposed and they need content development for that as well. So there's there's pieces there that, that can apply the core competencies to your exact to your exact point. Um, where it's outside of what would normally be the mass competitive environment as well. I've seen it for your world. It's pretty cool. So, and I, what I also like, John, is that you, it took you three to four years, and I apologize for that. I wasn't around three to four years ago to do this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, it was quite a bit to break into this space, but uh, now actually we, we're well known in the industry, but it takes constant pounding and really it's uh if you don't get attraction at a certain show it's not necessarily like oh you shouldn't go there the next year you just have to keep pounding the pavement especially in the training space so and, um, and I, just got to keep it, doing what you're doing it is like that across the board in in that in that the constant pounding and i i call it dripping most of the time most of the time you're dripping on them you're you're giving feeding them information just making sure you're top of mind um and that's where if you're and there, it's, it's a combination. You're going to have relationships that, that start to develop right away. If you're good, you do. And you've, you've been around. You know how to build relationships. I can tell just by the way that you operate on the phone. So knowing that you're building those relationships, some of those take years. Some of those take months. And some of those you just want to have a broad net to, to hit people that are doing those training pieces, even if you don't have relationships yet, to keep, to keep hitting them. So there's the marketing component. There's the sales component. There's the... There's the response component, obviously, and being able to respond and do the, the bids because some of those you're still going to have to do a response for a proposal. But, um, well, that's cool. So what's the name of your, your company again, John? I uh, the, our company is called uh, D2 Team Sim. Uh, we're in the simulation training slash IMI development space. Awesome. I was just talking with a lady. I got to introduce. I got your email here. It's Brian. Is it Brian? Yeah, I'm actually at Brian Lau. I'm, I'm actually speaking for my father, who is actually John Lau, who okay. actually sent me the link to, to go oh, uh, review some of this info. So you're an identity thief, I see. <laughs> Pretty much. Pretty much. Um, how is your uh, – let me just answer this real quick. I, look, we can take this offline, but I would definitely want to make sure that, um, uh, that uh, we disseminate – and I'll shoot this out to everybody as well um, – but to disseminate information on – uh, D2 teams to sim. I got somebody that, that I'd like to have to talk with you because they're doing simulation using the like video game graphic component. Yep, that's exactly and, what we're doing. Yeah, so I think there may be a there may be a fit for you. They're not a, they're not a client, but it's the it's the wife of a client. Okay. Um, a wife. Of, we might uh, actually know that. <laughs> And, and you you might I don't even know the name of their company because um, I think it's pretty fresh they're pretty fresh they have some I I'm not sure how innovative their ideas are because I I mean it's you know it's the you know the virtual life thing I don't know what you call it. you guys you guys you guys have oh, names the, all the, that. The, 
Second Life, things like that. Second Life, Second Life, kind of, kind of. Yeah, we're we're not doing things like that. Most of our things are uh, actually taking like a lot of hardcore video game technology and actually using that to train soldiers on different MOSs, like. Uh, if they have to do a Patriot missile, how to place a Patriot missile, we've done training like that in that space. Yeah, and that makes perfect sense. So, well, good, man. Well, let's uh, let's plan a time for us to catch up. If you could shoot me an email, um, great. it'd be great. Do that. I, I got yours. We'll plan a time. We can take some of this offline and talk a little bit more about what you need. And and even though you've already you took you three or four years, I'll bet you we still got we still got you on the intelligence piece. Just, just a guess. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully. Anyway. Yeah, well, hopefully I do, right? Because otherwise I have to be buying your intelligence. Anyway, all right, cool. Let me let me jump here to Mark because Mark had a real quick question. I think um, uh, Mark, you there? Mark is is asking a question. I don't know if he's still here or not, but uh, Mark's asking, "How's your success with medical staffing resources?" I got you unmuted, Mark. If you want to, I don't know if you're muted on your side or not, but um, we can talk for just a minute. Um, I, I, we don't have any experience with medical staffing services. Uh, we have experience some with uh, IT staffing services, as well as some others. There's 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 one outfit that I talked with about a month and a half ago that I would anticipate we're going to do some work with, and they do nurses. So I don't know if that fits. Are you? Am I missing you? Is I, I can't talk. I have you unmuted on my side, so I don't know if you're, if you're anyway, so um, we do most nurses. What, who, who are you with, Mark? While I wait for that. Premier Medical, okay. Um, I have to remember, it was, it was um, it's one of my, somebody that's in the Vistage group that I just joined, I can't remember who it is. Um, but yeah, I'll, I will. Uh, we, I'd love to talk with you about that because we're gonna we're gonna dive into some research in that most likely, and if we can, uh, if we can do that. Not sure how to get off mute. Let's see. Uh, connected to audio. It says everything's good. Tell you what, it's already twenty after twelve. <laughs> um, shoot me an email. Uh, at DLO at ISI Federal with, with your with your phone contact information. I might have it already, um, but if not, um, shoot me that. We can we can pick this up uh, offline and, and talk about that as well. Um, yeah, uh, any of the staffing, there's a lot of staffing that happens, obviously. Uh, any other questions real quick before we jump? And I really appreciate everybody going over. We usually try to keep this at, at 45 minutes to an hour, but um, there's, there's a lot of a lot of great questions. Always love to have the dialogue. And if there's anything, um, anything else we need, um, you can certainly raise your hand or uh, can't shout out. Well, I can unmute everybody, but that'll make a disaster. So, anyhow, thanks so much for joining me and for the for the interaction. We're going to do it again in a month, um, and next month it'll be a little bit more relaxed. And and I need to get out of here because I got a I have a couple of calls that I have to do. You're certainly. Uh, you're certainly welcome, Lynn, and uh, glad glad that you could join us. And uh, absolutely, uh, really appreciate it. Look forward to talking with everybody. Please feel free to give me a call on my cell or shoot me an email and let me know, and we can schedule a time to talk more specifically about uh, what you're doing and if we can help, and if not, who we can point you to that can. So thanks again, folks. Really appreciate the, the, the dialogue. Have a great, great, great rest of the day.